Let's finish up the chapter on Trinity. In part two, we're going to talk a little bit about the history of the Trinity. The earliest Christians were Jewish believers, and as Jews, they believed that there is only one God. We saw that in Deuteronomy 6, 4, and that God is Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, it's important to note that the early Christians continued to affirm their belief in only one God. Now, again, as we saw that the threeness of God, or the multiplicity of God, was being progressively revealed throughout the Old Testament and then uh, more clearly revealed in the New Testament. And then in the, in the early church, then, there were three major ecumenical councils, church councils, that are worth noting in order to trace the development of the doctrine, specifically of the Trinity. There were these three councils, if you're interested in this stuff, we'll quickly go through it. The first one is the Council of Nicaea in 325. And this council concluded that the Son was of one substance with the Father. And so this was really about the Father and the Son. In 381, the Council of Constantinople extended the discussion to the identification of the Holy Spirit within the Godhead. So the first one uh, took care of the situation with the Son, Jesus, and the second one took care of the Holy Spirit's divinity. And then the third one, the Council of Chalcedon, focused on the relationship of Christ's humanity to his divinity, so it just sort of got a little bit more specific about something called the hypostatic union. Again, these are this is a little bit specific, but it might be of interest to you to know how the councils, the early church councils, came up with the, with the doctrine of the Trinity. Again, they weren't just inventing this. This was all the way they were able to formulate it based on the clear teaching of Scripture. Now, some heresies have also arisen throughout history, and that the church... Uh, has had to deal with that denies one or all of these three things that we've already looked at in the doctrine of the Trinity. Again, here's the doctrine that God is three persons. Each person is fully God, but there's only one God in being or essence. Now, the first uh, heresy is called modalism. Modalism teaches that God is successively Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In other words, he's not simultaneously Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So sometimes he's in the mode of Father, and sometimes he's in the mode of Son, and sometimes in the mode of Holy Spirit. A lot of Christians actually erroneously believe this, but this is actually a heresy. This isn't at all what the biblical doctrine of the Trinity teaches. A second heresy is called Arianism. The central characteristic of Arian thought was that because God is one, Jesus could not have also been truly God. And so in order to deal with the scriptural testimony to the exalted status of Christ, Arius and his followers, these, these followers were uh, early Christians, they proposed that Jesus must just simply be the highest created being of God. So although Christ was fully human, Arians taught that he was not fully God. Again, this was addressed in the Council of Nicaea in 325, and this was rejected as heretical. And then and then the final uh, major heresy is called tritheism. Tritheism teaches the Trinity consists of three equal, independent, and autonomous beings, and each of them is divine. So there are three gods. And again, this isn't what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches there's one God who exists in three persons. Tritheism would just simplify it and say, no, there's just three gods. God the Father is God, God the Son is God, God the Holy Spirit is God, and they're all distinct beings. They're all distinct in essence. And that, of course, is heresy according to Scripture. Now, here's a good example of this, of an erroneous analogy uh, that would go along with tritheism. And maybe you've used this analogy before and didn't realize that this was actually heretical. The analogy is to say that the Trinity is like an egg with the three parts of yolk, white, and shell. Now, that's actually heresy because that would be saying that yolk is is the egg and white is the egg and shell is the egg. But if you think about it, maybe you can talk about this for a little bit. This is actually heretical. Uh, this isn't actually the biblical conception or the Christian Orthodox conception of the Trinity. Now let's finish up our study of the Trinity with practical implica implications. And I, I love how the authors uh, bring this home and, and make it practical. Well, that which is hypothetical, theoretical, and philosophical might be interested to, interesting to a few people. Only that which is practical is of service to all people. And so practically, um, they list out a few things. I want to just highlight a few right here. First, Trinitarian life is humble. The doctrine of the Trinity is so complex and wonderfully mysterious that it humbles us. Maybe you can pause and discuss any of these points if you'd like to. 
Second, Trinitarian life is loving. Think about it. God is a relational being. Relationship is about love. The Bible says God is love. Love is from God and Trinitarian life is indeed loving. Fourth, Trinitarian life is relational, obviously, because God's a relational being. And I like this, that sixth, Trinitarian life is submissive. Um, We hear Jesus submitting to the Father, and we also should submit to God, uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, because God is God, and we are not. Now take some time as you wrap up this chapter on the Trinity. Maybe you can review those three heresies and then spend some time talking about these questions before you move on to chapter 2.